Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. The daughters of Jerusalem. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love. And Anas did not want to go down to the street called Straight, and anoint one called Saul of Tarsus, because he was uh, a murderer. He killed Christians. The only thing God told Ananias to make him know that everything was all right is, Behold, he prayeth. If God says you're praying, then you're praying. I mean, you can mumble words all you want to as a religionist and not be praying, but God said he was praying. So it must have been a true spiritual prayer. And so here, the, the bride tells the daughters of Jerusalem, if you do find him, you will be praying. So if you do find my beloved, then Pray and tell him that I am sick with love. And then the daughters of Jerusalem, astounded by that hollow look in her eyes and the painful heart that is expressing itself through her body language, they wonder, who is this beloved that's so great that this woman seeks him so intensely and sometimes i think that our crosses do more to tell people that we're christians than our testimonies do of our mouth and they come back and they say what is thy beloved more than another beloved O thou fairest among women what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us. They don't say who is thy beloved. They know who the person is. But they say we must not know him like you do. So they don't ask her who is thy beloved. They say what is thy beloved that you love him so much and you have charged us with such a deep felt charge as this. The daughters of Jerusalem are mentioned seven times in this book. Eight times if you count chapter 3 and verse 11 where it calls them the daughters of Zion. They are in chapter 1 verse 5, chapter 2 verse 7, chapter 3 verse 5 and 10, chapter 5 verse 8, chapter 8 and 16, and chapter 8 verse 4. And then the daughters of Zion in chapter 3 and verse number 11. The daughters of Jerusalem are only spoke of one other time in your entire Bible. You can see it if you turn to Luke chapter 23. And it is now the beloved king that speaks this term and not the bride. In Luke 23... In verse number 27, as he bears his cross towards Calvary, it said, And there followed him a great company of people and of women. What kind of women? Women which also bewailed and lamented him. These are those wailing women that we found in Jeremiah 9, 17 through 20. These are those who were hired or expected to come in Matthew 9, 23 and 24, whose wailing and whose sorrow turns immediately into laughter and scoffing when Jesus tells them Jairus' daughter is not dead. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, what is the first three words he said in verse 28 of Luke 23? Right. There's the only time in your Bible it's found outside of the book of the Song of Solomon. It comes out of the mouth of Jesus. And not any other time than at the cross where affections and emotions in him and the intentions and the intensity 
of God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are at their height. The majesty and the glory of the God-man are seen here in the purity of his character. There is no inordinate affection with him. But here we have put together the daughters of Jerusalem, professional weepers and wailers with the Son of God. And he says unto them, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me. First of all, your tears are for the wrong person. Weep not for me. Me going to Calvary is nothing of sorrow that you can enter into. Dear friend, I venture to say that there's not been a soul on planet Earth that's ever in, entered into the kind of intensity that Jesus underwent as, he, as his sweat turned to great drops of blood and he went on to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I don't believe any mortal, mortal man could share with that. It's too powerful and too intense. It takes the God man. So the God man, even in his hour of deepest rejection, not just of the disciples who fled, the shepherd was smitten and the sheep scattered, but also the father himself. And in that hour, the one thing that's offensive to him is false weeping, first of all, because it's for the wrong person. Don't weep for me. You can't enter into this with a proper we weeping. It's only godly sorrow that does not have to be regretted or repented of. The sorrow of this world, which is this, worketh death. But he says, don't weep for me. But you do need to weep, but you need to weep with the reality of the terror of the oncoming wrath of God for yourselves and your children. You are of a natural birth, your daughters of Jerusalem, and your children are of a natural birth. They're your children. Whether the daughters of Jerusalem were actually elect and would be regenerate children of God, I don't know. But I know that they're primarily those who were raised up in Jerusalem. They were born there. They took it for granted that that's where they were supposed to be. They were raised up there. They got married there. They had children there. And they began to think of themselves because Zion... Jerusalem, the hill, holy hill, is more glorious to God than all the tents of Jacob. So says the scriptures. So they come to be filled with a pride and they come to assume that they're really not sinners, that they're really glorious, and that God owes them, and that they are so filled with themselves that they think they can weep for God as he goes to the cross. Poor old Jesus. We need to be saved from our own affections. But weep for yourselves and your children. I'm going to tell you something since we mentioned daughters and children. The days are coming on Jerusalem which they shall say, Blessed are the barren. All the fruit of the natural womb are going to be cut down. We'll find that in verse 31. You need to understand that because of what you're doing now, there is going to come on you a rage and a wrath. The scripture said, like it's never had been seen on earth before or since. And so you need to wake up. You're right here, as we say, in the moment, in the present. Here is where God Almighty, who has become flesh, is finding his way to Calvary. It must needs be, he said, that I be turned over to the Gentiles and be mocked of them. Or turned over to the Jews and be mocked of them and then 
them give me to the hands of Gentiles that they might uh, crucify me. This is why I was born. Shall I say, Father, deliver me from this hour? This is the very hour for which I have now come. And his high priestly prayer in John 17 says, Father, the hour has come. It's come time now for the glory of God. And the daughters of Jerusalem are so religious and they so lack spirituality and so lack the clarity of what they are perceiving and discerning at that moment that they're actually weeping about God going to the cross to save men's souls. They're in the same vein of Peter. Lord, be it not so unto thee. Takes his sword out, tried to cut off a man's ear, but he's a fisherman and he don't know sword fighting too good. And the guy ducks down and he cuts his ear off. Tries to cut the guy's head off and he cuts off his ear. And Jesus called Peter when he told him that he was not going to let him go to the cross. He called him Satan. So what do you call these people? This is the clearest and most powerful hour any God-man, and there's only been one, has ever approached. But the daughters of Jerusalem are weeping for him with an inordinate affection, trying to keep him from and acting like they're sympathetic towards his not being crucified. So he says, you know, they said, blessed are the paps that bore thee, or, the, or that sustained you and the womb that bore thee. He said, it won't be long. You're going to say, blessed are the barren, and blessed are the wombs that never bear, and blessed are the paps which never gave suck. If you had an understanding of what was going on before you, you would be weeping for yourselves and your children. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. We'd rather be buried alive than to continue on in this wrath now that we have begun to experience it. Let me tell you how bad it is. Any of you have a fireplace, wood stove. You start that fire, wad up paper as tight as you can. It's nothing but wood and thin sheets. Then you put your kindling on, or as some dear sister sent me, thank God for it, your fat wood. We used to call it fat lighter because it, it lit up easy. Then your kindling. And then your smaller pieces of wood, and then your larger, and you set it on fire from the bottom. The point is, you burn the lesser in order to get the greater to burning. And whatever you burn, you make sure that it's dry. Jesus said, you don't realize that this fire is so hot that me as the green tree, see verse 31? For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done when this wrath that falls on me falls on the dry tree of religion in Jerusalem? Y'all are in a heap of trouble. Back before you had to have a license and a permit, to burn in your own property. I was burning some shrubs, that, uh, some clippings from some shrubs that I had cut down. And some of them had a lot of green leaves on it. My fire was hot. And I'd stick that green limb, a limb down there. And you wouldn't believe all the crackling and the popping it did. And it was just fun to hear it. I'd go cut another. Poor old bush. Didn't need to be cut back that much, but I like to hear that crackling and the popping. It's because there was water in it, moisture in it. But that fire was so hot it would burn that green. But if you put leaves or something dead on it, it would go up immediately. And the Lord Jesus Christ is telling the daughters of Jerusalem, 
not the high priests, not the disciples, not quote unquote the Jews, not the multitudes, but the daughters of Jerusalem. He's telling them, your emotions are out of order here. You ought to be crying for yourself because the wrath of God's going to fall on me and I am a green tree. I am in all points tempted yet without sin. And because I am going to become sin for the elect church, then I am going to have to die. The wages of sin is death, so I don't need to be paid off. I don't have any sin. But he that knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the green tree with just imputed sin is going to be burned up. The crackling and the popping is going to be unbelievable because the fire is hot. And the wrath of God being that hot, on again, being that hot against sin, if you burn up that green tree, you're next. And you're a dry tree. So what's going to happen when the wrath of God falls on Jerusalem in 70 A.D. when Titus, the Roman general, comes through and doesn't leave any of y'all alive? They were slitting their bellies open because the Jews were swallowing their gold and jewels to hide them from the Romans. The blood was unbelievably deep and they took that city down to the ground. Jesus said not one stone's going to be left on another. If you want to get a picture of the daughters of Jerusalem, go to the person who is the truth, and there it is. So we see, dear soul, this is where she was trying to find her comfort. It is a place, dear soul, where uh, there was enough sympathy. And I think it was some of it just old raw sympathy that was here. Uh, but it was enough to sustain her and to give her some comfort that she could not find in her heart sick love. Let me read you uh, in Zechariah chapter 11, if you will, beginning with verse number one. Follow along, if you will, Zechariah chapter 11 in verse one. Open thy doors, O Lebanon. And what is Lebanon? It is a forest of cedars. Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. This is a fiery wrath from God. And it falls upon Christ. Then how for a tree, the church, for the cedar is fallen. Why does the cedar speak of Christ? It won't rot. What do you ladies have at the foot of your bed to have all of your important materials in? I don't know what you'd call them, blankets and so forth. Cedar chest, right? It won't rot. You want to preserve them, you put them in a cedar chest. If the Lord is going to burn up the cedar that won't rot, if he's perfect, Christ, then the church better watch out. How, fir tree, for the cedar is fallen. Because the mighty are spoiled. How, ye oaks of Bashan, for the forest of the vintage is come down. There is a voice of the howling of the shepherds, for their glory is spoiled. A voice of the roaring of young lions, for the pride of Jordan is spoiled. You smite the shepherd and the sheep are scattered. There is going to be a, such a powerful burning that it's going to burn up the thickets around the Jordan from which the young lions raise their cubs. And one of the things that God asked Jeremiah if these footmen tire you, and that's all the afflictions you've got now, just footmen, what are you going to do when the horsemen come? 
worse judgment is going to come on you. And then he said, and what are you going to do at the drying up of the Jordan? What was he talking about? You dry up Jordan, all the foliage around it dies, and that's where the lions are that raise, what do you call it? I'm going to say families. You figure it out. Then you got lions coming into the city. When the fire starts, mark it down. Ye who are not daughters of Jerusalem, church members only. You who are in and involved and derived from the cross of Jesus Christ, you understand that if the fire is so hot to show us what God thinks of sin, so that if his own son becomes just imputed with sin, what he did to him, how God feels about sin for the rest of us. Howl fir tree. Thus saith the Lord my God, and look at the rest of verse 4 of Zechariah 11. Thus saith the Lord my God, feed the what? Wow. Of what? The you know what a fatted calf is? You put it up. You confine it. It doesn't get to run and frolic. You feed it. You overfeed it. You stuff it. And let it get fat. The fatted calf. But why are you treating that calf so wonderfully well and the rest of them got to, you know, get what they can out there in the pasture with their mama? Because you're going to kill him. I wonder how fat America is now. I wonder how fat the daughters of Jerusalem are now. I wonder if there's anybody that's got the slightest inkling of what Jesus Christ was meaning to the daughters of Jerusalem in Luke 23 and warning them if the wrath of God can burn me a green tree, what is it going to do when it gets a hold of you dry trees? I wonder if there's anybody in America even thinks about being under the wrath of God right now. Mm. That's amazing, isn't it? Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4. And it shall come to pass, verse 3, Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 3, and it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, well, I'm in Zion, I'll be all right. I've been baptized, I'll be all right. I'm a member of the church, I'll be all right. I got a Bible, I'll be all right. I, I made a profession of faith, I'll be. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. When? After or when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and, you read it, by the spirit of burning. Goes right along with what Jesus was talking about. The wrath and fire of God is so hot that if it would do that to Jesus Christ, the green tree, what will it do the rest of us dry trees? We are not equal with God. I and the Father are one. I, I'm not. I, I'm not a green tree. Uh, he has life. He is life. My life is dependent upon His mercy. I can be today and tomorrow be cast into the fire. It's my life is not my own. I'm not a green tree. I, I don't have life in me of myself, but he does. So he says the only way the blood in Jerusalem is going to be purged is by the spirit of burning. 
that's the way that it is. Revelation 17. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. We have in times past. But what it says is, Revelation 17, it says there's going to come not a one world government, but a confederacy of nations who agree in one spirit to hate religion. It says these have one mind, verse 13, Revelation 17, 13, these have one mind. And by the way, in verse 10, it says they shall continue a short space. That's the same thing in Revelation 20 and verse 3 as the little season. So during the time of the little season, there will be nations who agree because they're getting their spirit from the devil. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. That is, civil government. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, because He is Lord of all lords, and He's King of all kings. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. And He saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. Now, the Lord is going to overcome them and preserve uh, his people that are called and chosen and faithful. But they shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. There is the fire that Jesus spoke of that shall destroy the dry tree. He said the Jews are going to get me and, and they're going to turn me over to the Gentiles and the Gentiles are going to destroy me. It was the beast that destroyed Jesus, but they were only the puppet of the Jews. <clears throat> it goes back to that same thing here. The beast. The beast shall hate the whore. The beast shall strip her of all her holdings. Do away with her being able to take off her income tax, that which she denotes, excuse me, uh, devotes to the church, and shall burn her with fire. Listen, verse 17. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill two words. You better be careful. You're going to hear the right-wing conservatives saying, Oh, they're persecuting the church. We need to all get together. A confederacy, a confederacy. And Isaiah chapter 8 said, Don't you say a confederacy to them that say a confederacy. You let God be your dread. Don't you get on in on anything of fighting governments to, uh, to, to, rest, to uh, restore or maintain religion. Because it's God's will that religion finally gets put in the fire as the dry tree. You better be careful. Oh, if we don't protect them, then we may lose our rights. You ain't got no rights. The only rights I got is to go to hell. God pay me off any time he wants to. Listen, my privilege is to follow Jesus Christ and bow my soul and head and heart to him. You be careful. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast. Listen at the last part of verse 17. Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. There's not many people going to be able to handle that. Oh, we better stand up against the government. They're saying that they're going to... Take away the holdings of the church. They're going to tax us like they do everybody else. We're not going to have any deductions for our contributions. They're going to burn you with fire, religion. Why? 
Because they're of the devil. You better be careful how you call God the devil. That's blasphemy. God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his word. I'm telling you, and I wish you knew how important it was. You better hold on to nothing but Jesus. Nothing. So this is what he says to the daughters of Jerusalem. That's the only time that it's mentioned, that phrase is mentioned in the scriptures other than in the Song of Solomon. Now, in chapter 1 and verse number 5, that's 30 minutes. Can you take 28 more? If you're getting sleepy, get up and go wash your face. If you want me to quit, everybody stick your hand up and I'll go home. All right, chapter 1 and verse, four, verse 5, the daughters of Jerusalem. We're studying the daughters of Jerusalem. What is the first impression of the elect child of God who has just been converted when they see all these church members? I am black. I'm a sinner. I'm wretched. I don't deserve to come among y'all. She has been awakened to the wonderful mouth of God. Verse 2, kiss me. How did Adam get life? God breathed into his nostrils and he became a living soul. It is at the mouth of God that you're saved. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So she has been enticed to the mouth of Solomon. Verse 4, John 6, 44, John 12, 32. If I be raised up, lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. No man cometh to me except the Father who sent me. Draw him. Verse 4, she's experiencing God drawing her. All she's got is the, the love and the enticement of the mouth of her beloved. Kiss me. Then she realizes that she can't not run after him. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. Then she sees the daughters of Jerusalem. I am black, but comely, O daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. So we find out, dear soul, that there is value in her, although she's feel, she feels like that she's worthless. Her natural kin, verse 6, my mother's children were angry with me. And they made me keepers of their vineyard. But they left my vineyard unkept. She was like Cinderella. Had to do all the washing and scrubbing and ironing. And the cross-eyed step uglies got all the blessings. But ain't that the way it is? But she's chosen by Solomon and he brings her, draws her, kisses her, and then in verse 7, tell me, she gets addicted to the revelation of the gospel. She's being drawn to Christ. And in that, when she looks at the daughters of Jerusalem, she says, y'all are so glorious. She thinks every one of them is saved. She thinks every one of them is perfect with God. She don't think there's any tares among all that wheat. She thinks she's the only sinner there is in the world. Can you identify with that? Let me get that right. Can you din, 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 identify with that? That's what I said, wasn't it? I am black, but I'm comely. I'm beautiful. It comes from the word beautiful in Isaiah 52, 7. There's nothing more beautiful to God than the repentant sinner. And I showed you that this morning in Song 2, 14, about the dove in the rock, trembling among the down drafts in that dangerous position. 
I am black, but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem. And she says in verse 6, don't look at me. They really ought to be looking at her, but she don't know that. Don't look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. I've been out in the afflictions and trials without hope and without God in this world, but I only have this drawing, this unspeakable, irresistible call of God in my soul. And I know that I don't know one book from another. I call the book of Job the book of Job. I didn't know anything. I call Malachi Malichi. I didn't have any idea what the Bible's about. I didn't know the books of the Bible. I never owned one. All I got is this irresistible call in my soul that I must have Jesus. So she looks at the daughters of Jerusalem. Got their hats with their feathers sitting in church. You know, got their dresses on. They're all decked out. They got their jewels and got their chains of gold and all that. And she said, I ain't worthy to be with y'all. I'm an old country girl. I'm just burned, sunburned. Been working out in the, in the fields all day. And God said, you're the one I want. Isn't that amazing? You're the one I want. She seeks his presence. She was foreloved. He was kissing her in verse 2 and drawing her before she ever knew what it was all about. And in Ephesians chapter number 1, in verse number 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus according as He has chosen us in Him, in Christ, in Solomon, in the King before the foundation of the world as for your mama was ever born that, he, that we should be holy and without blame listen before Him in love. All she knew was there was an unbelievable love that had come in her heart for the great King. And that was that love that would not let her go. She rested her weary soul in Him and gave Him back the life she owed that in His ocean depths His flow may richer and fuller be. Oh, dear soul, Thank God for that effectual call. Thank God that it makes us desire God more than we desire our normal food. But yet it causes us to say to the rest of the church, you know the books of the Bible. You know about the Good Samaritan. You know about this, that, and the other. I'm not worthy to be here. I'm black, but I'm comely. The Lord finds some beauty in me that He desires. That's all she had. That's what the daughters of Jerusalem, that's how they affected her at first. First Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse 13. First Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believed. You received the word of God from us, but it was truly, absolutely, without doubt, the word of God. And it had its, effect, its effectual work in your heart because God had granted faith to you. So she says, I'm not worthy to come among you. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In verse 10, Paul said, We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise. In Christ, we're weak, but you're strong. You're honorable, but we are despised. He's looking upon the other man's and not upon his own. He's esteeming the other 
more blessed, more highly than he is himself. That's a total reversal of the natural birth. You don't get that in Adam. You only get that in Christ. You cannot think yourself to be black, but only comely in the effectual call of God, except by the Holy Ghost. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 12. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 12. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet it is not washed from their filthiness. The most deceived soul in the world is one that doesn't think he's deceived. If you never have any spiritual anxiety spells where you don't know whether you're saved or not and you fear for your eternal well-being you think God may cast me into hell any minute then you're not really saved. Every time the true believer sees his carnality in his flesh he feigns himself to be cast off from God. Oh my soul I am black but comely in Christ. Luke 15 and verse 7. Luke chapter 15 and verse number 7. I say unto you that likewise the joy of finding the lost sheep or finding the lost corn how thrilled we are. And it's gotten to be a commonplace with me anymore. Lord, you know where my glasses are. I don't know where I put them. Lord, you know where this, that, and the other is. And I got to find it. You know how important it is. I couldn't find my billfold the other day. And I just had to get out on my knees and say, Lord, you're looking at that thing right now. Where in the world I put it? I don't have any idea. I don't never lay it down, but I did. And the Lord lead, it, lead me to it. And the first thing I do before I even pick it up is say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I praise you for helping me find it. He said, there ain't no joy at all compared to this. Listen, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one what? Yes. Say it out loud. Sinner. sinner one sinner more joy over one sinner that repenteth more than over almost a hundred other people 99 just persons they're not just they just think they are they're like the ones in verse 2 the Pharisees and scribes murmured saying this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them so he's guilty by association more than over 99 just persons which have need, which need no repentance. Then in Luke chapter 16 and verse 15. And he said unto them, Ye are they which two words. Justify yourself. You see, friend, everybody believes in justification. I've had city jail ministries, county jail ministries, state jail ministries, and even a federal jail ministry, and I have never seen a guilty convict. Every last one of them, I didn't do it. It's a rare thing, friend. Everybody believes in justification. Kid, I told you not to get into that cookie jar before supper. But mama, I was hungry. Justification. Everybody believes in justification. It's just, the issue is, who does the justifying? Year they which justify yourselves before men. They can get out of anything. 
tell you a lie to your face and then tell you why they had to do it when you catch them in it. They which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men, finish it for me. Is of abomination in the sight of God. That's pitiful. You want to do it again? Go. Is of abomination in the sight of God. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, my soul. Listen. I had not known covetousness except the law had said thou shalt not lust. You don't know that you're a sinner until you're saved and already got a new heart. And as God kisses you and draws you and brings you into Him, you are telling the rest of the church, I am black. I'm not worthy to be among you. You're daughters of Jerusalem. And I am but a saved sinner. But she says, but I am comely. Psalm 149, verse 4. Psalm 149. The bride hath made herself ready. She's bedecked herself with the jewels of the gifts of the Spirit. She has put on her robe of righteousness. Psalm 149 and verse 4. For the Lord taketh pleasure in His people. He will what? The meek. Beautify. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Did you know that in the Song of Solomon, one of the verses saying, I shouldn't get up here without knowing where it is, but I'll find it later for you. He said, turn your eyes from me, for with one of your eyes do you do make me swoon. That's God talking to you. Your righteousness is so perfect, it's the righteousness of God. God has made you beautiful in His eyes. And He said, you got to quit looking at me, I can't hardly stand it. God talking to the church. That's not the other way around. Ain't that amazing? Yeah. I bet you won't take that to yourself for the rest of the day. You won't think about it another time because you can't believe it. Song of Solomon chapter 2. I'll try to finish up. Let me just show you this next time the daughters of Jerusalem are seen. Chapter 2, verse number 1. Verses 1 and 2, the king reveals himself. I am. That ought to set you to thinking who it is right there. I am the bread of life. I am the door of the sheep. I am that I am. I am the great shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I am the chief shepherd. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. If whosoever love it is, is among the daughters, then he must be a male. So this is the Lord talking. Then from what the Lord says about himself, she begins her discourse. And in this, she reveals herself, but only as far as she sees herself in Him. You can't define yourself as a Christian without defining Christ. She told the daughters of Jerusalem about the locks of His hair when they asked her, What is thy beloved more than our beloved? Because His locks of His hair had been wet with the dew that she wouldn't let Him in the door. Her experiences of God give her an understanding of herself. And she expresses herself in terms of knowing Him. So what did he say in verse 2? As the lily among 
thorns. How does she start in verse 3? As the apple tree among the trees of the wood. I want to let you see how glorious my church is. Look among, look among the thorns and the tares. And there is that beautiful lily. What a contrast between the thorns that shall be gathered and burned and this beautiful lily that toils not, neither does it spin, yet Solomon in all of his glory is not arrayed like unto one of these. Her beauty is my righteousness. Her glory is, is, is my esteem for her and my honor of her in trusting only in me. And she picks it up and said, well, then as the apple tree is among all the rest of the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shade, shadow. Where'd you get that? Where are you going to feed your flock today at noontime with a, the with a heat the greatest it's going to be? Chapter 1 and verse 7. As he tells her how to find that, go down by the shepherd's tent and so forth, she finds the shade of being in that uh, shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land. And so when it comes time for her to testify of him, she picks up from his words and from his experiences to define who she knows him to be. In the real sense, God as God cannot be known except by God himself. The best we can do is know the Lord Jesus Christ. We beheld His glory as of the only begotten glory of the Father. You say, I, give his, I can give you His attributes, but you can't tell me Him. You can tell me about Him, but you can't tell me Him because you don't know Him. In his, no man has seen God in any You can't know God in the fullness of His personal glory and essence. But we have a mediator between. And so it's by these things that we speak of Him. We learn to say the things that we have heard. Why does the little child call a chair a chair? Because mom and daddy said it was. Well, if she'd been raised up in Spain, she'd have called it something else. Oh, here I go again, painting myself in a corner. I don't know what the Spanish word is for chair, but she'd call it something else. But you learn by the experience of that one that loves you and that birthed you and that brought you to himself and owns you as his child. So she says, then as the apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. That's Verse 2 what he said about me. And then I want you to know in chapter 1 and verse 7 and 8, I sat under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me. I didn't rush right in myself. He brought me to the banqueting house. Love's beyond Imagination. My Bible quit being a textbook and came to introduce the Word and the Word was opened by the Holy Ghost and I, God gave me understanding as He opened the Scriptures to my heart and opened my heart to the, under, to the understanding of the Scriptures. It turned out to be a virtual banqueting house. I told somebody the other day, i got to quit reading. i got to stop reading. Everything I read, it blows up and gets so big and it's just overcoming me. I can't stand any more of it. I had to close my Bible. That don't happen every day. There's times when I can't even open it and find anything. But sometimes he brings you to the banqueting house. And guess what? The banner over her is that which declares him, the banner over her is love. 
I didn't bring in here to debate with you how many horses, hairs there are in that horse's tail in the book of the Revelation. I, I didn't bring you in here to see if you're a superlapsarian or ultra or whatever, all that junk. I, listen, I don't care whether you're premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, or panmillennial. I don't care what you are. This ain't about theology. It's about the love of God and you being swallowed up in the vastness of the love of God. It's a banqueting house for heaven's sake. And there's plenty enough to go around. Guess what happens to her? In verse 5, she swoons. She's got so much love, she can't, she can't contain herself. She tells the Lord God, I'm sick with love. In verse 5, he has to give her the wine mingled with milk. Guess what she, he comforts her with in verse 5? Tell me. He comforts me with apples. What is he in verse 3? An apple tree. You ain't going to get just one apple off an apple tree. You can get all the apples you want. She is so caught up in the vastness and the say it, ecstasy, ec ecstasy of the love of God and overcome with it, she swoons. He has to support her for her to be able to take more love. Guess what he does? His left hand is under my head. God has to sustain her. He has to undergird her with the power of his arm. He has to sustain her because she can't contain the vastness of the essence of God who is, a lo who is love himself. And so he has to kind of take a break and put his hand under her head and get some fruit and uh, some flagons to be able to nourish her, to get her recovered and strengthened again because he doesn't intend to quit loving her for all eternity. His right hand doth embrace me. So in verse 1 and 2, he reveals himself. And beginning at verse 3 through 6, she describes her experience both from his words and from his love. And then she turns to the daughters of Jerusalem in verse 7 and said, I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the fast fleeting deer roves in the hinds of the field, how fast they move and how glorious they are and how they are of such almost a mystical being fleeting through the woods in that kind of beauty and glory and fast moving circumstance this thing is moving so fast on me I charge you in all the glory of that which is mine and one moment excuse me a year with him seems like one moment you say what are we going to do in eternity you evidently don't know God because you ain't going to do nothing you're going to be and being involved with God it's timeless. I charge you by the rose and by the hinds of the fields that you stir not up nor awake my love, listen, until he pleases. She said, don't mess with this. I am not going to let my religion mess with my spirituality. I have done it too long. 
I was brought in among the Southern Baptists and they baptized me and I stayed among them as a lost church member for seven years. And then as I progressed through the Southern Baptists, I was brought into the Independent Baptists and they told me what not to do for a number of years. Legalistic morality. Then I was brought in and introduced to the Sovereign Gracers with a sprinkling on of primitive Baptist influence and it seemed like theology was the thing and old Lang Syne, we got to keep on being like we were and, and my spirituality began to say, you got to get out of here. This thing is hindering you. You got to move on. And after all of that and popping out of that last cloud, my head came out and now I am discovering Christ. And I turn around to all of them and say, thank you for putting up with me. Thank you for all the mean and unkind things you did to me, but also for the nice and pleasant things you were to me. It was God's will for me to be among you, but I want you to know one thing. This thing is as beautiful and moving as fast as the hinds and the rows of the field. Don't mess with it. I will not allow my religion to hinder my spirituality. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? Well, I've already got there. What do you want to know? I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ right now. What do you want to know? I want you to know that God in all of His glory has been calling us to Him all this time. Yes, He led us through many dangers, toils, and snares that we have already come through. Grace has led us safe thus far, and grace will lead us on. But dear soul, the whole thing was not so that I might be faithful in a religious performance, but it was so that I might come to the place where all of that should be torn away from me and I could see he who my soul loveth and find out that I was in love with a person and not a program. I was in love with God and not just a form of a man called Jesus. Mm. The Lord, the Lord has been so good to us. It is amazing what he's doing and he saves us the best till last. <laughs>